Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. For today's episode, I am seated very awkwardly in a uh, cross leg in a chair that has sidebars. <laughs> Side <clears throat> handles, you know? So, <clears throat> it's a special episode. Yeah. I wanted to speak about uh, I mean, what is this whole trend we see? that there are many bookstores with this section, the self-help section, you know? And so I wanted to look at this mindset. Usually when you look at how things are known, they are known through the approaches of human beings. <clears throat> so every idea known to man has arose from uh, the vision of man whether it is in the inner vision or the outer vision or an infusion of the two, someone making an observation, for example, gravity, noticing dropping and letting go of an object and seeing the gravitational pull. You know, the object falls towards the center. Third. So w what do you see? You notice that it's an observation of your outer realms. It was an outer realm activity. It doesn't matter how many times you let go of the object, it changes. But if you were to look at your inner realm activity, if you were to ask the same question over and over again, you'll notice you're never asking it the same way in every time you're asking it. <clears throat> what that means is where is the vision of the self arising. If you are somebody who your existence, your identity is from someone else, someone else is giving you your identity or you're dependent upon a certain environment for your identity. Only the outer realms can free you. You know, it depends on, you know, it's fair to say everybody in this life is I, I mean this is extreme words but is a slave to something now let me tell you what i mean by that uh <clears throat> there was this uh psychologist um who had studied the brain and had found a very unique metaphor in explaining what is happening when actually a human being is remembering phenomena or when you experience something new and that becomes a memory what's happening and the psychologist, I for, honestly forget his name, but I remember reading his book, like I, could, I, I can see his book in my head years ago. But <clears throat> the thing was, um, he had said that the mind uh, see it as a, as, a, as a cube of jello, a cube of jello. And imagine you poured a, sp a, a spoon of hot ink on this jello. What does that mean? That means the hot ink would fall on the jello and make it dent. It would, it would, it would make uh, a certain shape. Now, if you were, now here's the next crucial point. If you were to make, uh, if you were to pour another uh, spoon, tablespoon of hot ink on this jello, from the dent that it had made before, it tunnels through, through a more complex dent. Okay? <clears throat> and what the psychologist was trying to say about the nature of the memory is that every experience you have is changing the experience. You know, it's like this hilarious way of trying to identify the human being. You're like, okay, uh, if I wanted to uh, look at the brain, what is happening at the brain, in the brain, you would look at it so neurologically sure you could tell like you could they've done this they've like i don't know i don't know if they've done this in the dalai lama but certain monks they've they've had certain equipment connected to them to check their brain waves <clears throat> i don't know what is it uh mri scans or whatever like they, they're trying to see their brain i mean not mri scans but you know cer certain things that could pick up on the signal of the brain and when you look at the brain is your brain the same way? That means uh, in your brain what's happening is that there's neural synapses. You know, so neurons are moving from position to position and it's firing up things in the brain. Now, which, which, who are you? Are you when the neuron moved or are you at the person after the neuron moved? Do you know? The, the person before the neuron moved or after the neuron moved? 
move. So you see, there's no way we can just put all of life in a picture and feel content about it. <clears throat> now, when we look at this idea of sight, you know, there was, when I was younger, I liked certain songs. When I got older, I didn't like them anymore. You know, there are certain phases of life where the words of others can be helpful because you want to see what's out there in the world. You have to consider that, you know, before you were born, you don't have any life experience. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about reincarnation in Buddhism. That's different <clears throat> talk. But what I'm saying is, like, we're kind of born tabula rasa style. What does that mean? That means a blank slate. That means uh, the child is not defining life by its own information. It is being informed by life and then being processed into a form, into a personhood and whatnot. <clears throat> and of course, the subtitle for this episode is The Mystic's Opening. So my focus is <clears throat> on really, could there potentially be a mystical, um, transition or a state of mind that collectively we will all feel or experience in the future. I would say that when I think about the members of a civilization, before I think about, like, you could see a person going and getting a self-help book. It's like, I'm helping myself. You know? <laughs> and it's, it's hilarious. They call it self-help because in reality, even though they're writing that for the person to, for a second feel they can help themselves, but in reality, you're, when you read the words of others, you don't actually, yourself doesn't help you, you know. In these talks, I, I, I tell people often, you know, and I, I'm pretty sure if these talks get a bigger following, um, this message is, is not going to get to everybody. But it's this idea that in life, it's pretty much a happening. It's an occurrence. You open your eyes and it's an event. You have opened your eyes in the middle of a very simple and complex simultaneously event. What does that mean? That means you look at the human being and it's starting from simpler principles. We were all kids once. <clears throat> you see? And then, as we go through experiences in life, layers of complexity build up over time. It's like the snowball effect, but with experience. Before 2011, I did have an experience with self-help. <clears throat> I had this stress, I remember in my writings, one, one friend I've had from the beginning uh, of my life, one friend that always would listen when I would speak was the empty page. You know, some people, um, they write for fun. You know, some people write for work, but some people write because if they don't, uh, they evaporate. <clears throat> the human being requires a certain expression and the more life becomes important for you the more intense uh, your expression becomes people don't realize a lot of the problems in their life that they're going for self-help all these poor souls who are like oh law of attraction oh my god let me let me just repeat this like a robot and attract everything i want that is not how life works it is way more natural than that it is way more than wishfulness in this realm that means the wishful will get a certain karma. If you're that person just hoping for the best, you have a different karma than the, the, the person preparing for the best. This law of attraction thing, let me tell you what the issue of it is. The unnaturalness to behavior. That means it, ha it, it follows a stoic principle. Do you know? Keep yourself in, a, in an attitude that is way more vibrant. For example, Epictetus, the stoic um, 
this man of stoicism. <laughs> he says, um, we do not suffer um, <clears throat> from the events. We suffer not from the events in our life. We suffer, uh, we suffer not from the events in our life. We suffer, um, we suffer from our judgments about them. There we go. You don't suffer because of the event. You know, something that happens to you, it's just something that happens. But you suffer from how that event uh, fit into your internal, let us say, psychological constitution. This idea of the psyche is a mystery. You know, we're like a lantern that can't see the flame. Do you know? We can see the wax of the candle, you know? We're like that light. You know, imagine the, the light beam is... Let me see how can I can explain this. I mean, guys, the, the thing about this cosmos is that the more you look into it in regards to cosmology, uh, the more complex the relationships become, but in the explanation of everything, whether it's something simple or complex, there is events taking place. And if the person notices the event, and if the person doesn't eat breakfast, <laughs> I'm joking. civilization in need of self-help a very profound question do we help ourselves from our inner realms or do we wait for the outer realms to come and help us You see, life, I'm telling you guys, the simplest way, I have looked at this world of ours many, in many ways. Pretty much every day I wake up, I'm trying to find a new way to look at it. <clears throat> because it gets, after a while, it repeats. And when it repeats, you see the patterns. When you see the patterns, you, you see there's a type of karma where it's an instant feedback where the person has an opinion on. But then there is a type of karma which is what you knew, what you didn't do. I can't tell you the strangeness of that, that feeling when something in the moment calls to you, you know? I, I'm lucky to have, uh, f I feel, be, been born in a, at a point where it was the convergence. Uh, it was like, I would consider, of course, I was born in 1991, and I would say that would be... It's like I've, I've, I was born in the winter of the subjective evolution. There is a concept very frightening, and not very fr not, not that frightening, but I'm telling you there's a concept in mathematics which is intense. And it's this idea of a fractal infused with infinity. An infinite fractal is one of the most advanced and unfathomable ideas. Let me tell you what I mean by that. A fractal is a suggestion that what is happening on a macrocosmic level is also happening on a microcosmic level. That means, as Plato said, as above, so below. You know, what we think is happening on Earth, guess what? It's there's so many uh, celestial objects in the sky are dictating everything from the ocean waves. You think the moon has an influence on ocean waves, but it doesn't have uh, any influence on you? <laughs> there's many things that influence us. And the dilemma, uh, the, 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 the reason I say it's a frightening idea, because human beings are rational, uh, have attempted rationality uh, through a language that they have designed themselves. So what does that mean? 
that means we can eat as much as as big as the spoon is in our hand and language for our civilization is like the spoon and the mind is is this consciousness that is present here and the mind is eating or sometimes by its environment being spoon-fed reality as far as I'm concerned most people are just looking for a story to be in very few people on this planet can be comfortable without narrative and the interesting thing is it's going to change there's a huge possibility in the future we might experience a silent civilization I'm saying it's 50 50 let me tell you what I mean by that that it's the same idea of the unfathomability of something on multiple levels being multi-dimensional and being infinite that means it wasn't just uh, you know the reflection your reflection between two mirrors that was infinite it was as if the whole universe and I was like what would be the biggest excuse my language but the mind fuck of all mind fucks for cosmology that at the edge of the universe there is a mirror <clears throat> that's one thing I, I feel science is going to it's gonna break science's heart when they realize that everything to life regardless of rationality whole has a symmetry to it I would say there is a law of symmetry you can see it look at your own body look at the design of phenomena look at many objects that if you saw only half of it and you literally copy pasted that in Photoshop and rotated it on the other side it would become another object Do you know that means what's really fascinating is if I drew a vertical line <clears throat> everybody's the same I think if you draw if you if you if the person draws a vertical line I don't know, unless you're a clone made in a laboratory where you have symmetrical perfection of unfathomable belief. <laughs> but I'm saying if if any person you you draw a line, imagine the person was standing in a portal where the left side of their body was on one side of the portal and the right side of their body was on the other side of the portal. So literally the portal is going through their forehead, if you can see what I mean, vertically. So if you divide it, like if you just saw half of your body vertically, you drew a line from the middle of who you are, and you literally, if in your mind, if you could visualize half of your body being separate, and that Photoshop effect I told you of uh, the bringing the symmetry of each half, you would have totally different beings. <clears throat> you would have two different beings. And I think it's the cool thing that nature has this geometrical symmetrical position but because we are human beings that there is a genetical reproduction game going on in this in, in that that is our continuity it means there are um, the, uh, intersection of different patterns trying to continue in the moment you can think of this idea of evolution and survival of the fittest then you can think of every cell in your body is trying to survive you know The thing is about self-help is that no one can really help the self that only you see. And that's the issue. I don't know if anybody's ever experienced this. If you've had a friend who they've they've complained an issue in their about an issue in their life and you've talked to them and you're like, don't worry about it, think about it, and then at the end of the conversation you're like, wait a minute, this isn't even like an issue for the person. The person just wants to uh um, be in a spotlight, you know. <clears throat> you see, the, the, the life is multi-dimensional. Simply so.
when you realize no one on this planet has your inner realms, there comes not only an acknowledgement of your own presence for the first time, but the acknowledgement that if there is anything to happen in this life, especially for your immediate experience, your attention needs to be engaged. So to study the attention is the smartest thing. But how do we get to studying the attention? It's not very easy at first because the attention is fragmented in various classifications of uh, when, ch when, the, when the human being was a child, it had an emotional a justification of reality people don't realize it but just like when a salesman says something to you and you're like I don't know about that like that's your emotions what does that mean that means the child is conditioned to emotionally think through the environment and then to rationalize now it is true that certain children are denied this em 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 their emotional evolution you know it's like when you see people <clears throat> for example in Eastern cultures compared to Western cultures, you know what you see? Western culture has mastered the emotional realm uh, much more uh, accurately than uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Eastern cultures, which they have mastered discipline. What does that mean? Western part of the world ran towards freedom. The Eastern part of the world ran towards discipline. These two hemispheres of the brain are ready. And when shall the global come into building a civilization to an advanced civilization to how a civilization can help itself that it must be designed like a brain and if you notice the parts of your brain can you imagine in your right brain hemisphere what it wore imagine your right brain hemisphere was racist to the uh, left brain hemisphere do you know you would see that the brain would not work properly, would not function properly. It is only when human beings realize that they can't be judged by any thought because life has a dynamism to it. Something that uh, no, the shaman uh, in silence watched and wondered when, when it would be voiced was this notion that silence is moving the noise. And if people understand that, you will become an advanced communicator. I'm not joking. You know, you don't become an advanced communicator by just communicates thinking you're communicating in advanced ways the advancement of the communication is that we start as an egoic creature as a self no we don't start but we we end up at, by the age of uh, what do they say 12 to 14 you <clears throat> you solidify in your individual consciousness let's say Zen Master Dogen has this saying, he says, to study, he says to follow the Buddha's path. Study the self. To study the self, you must forget the self. To forget the self <clears throat> is to awaken to the nature of all things. What does that mean? That means when you are not an idea, perhaps there is a huge potential your mind is experiencing the whole moment as itself. If you notice, if you want to know how language is artificial, Go talk to an animal. Go talk to uh, a, a jaguar or a wolf or a tiger about to jump at you and be like, Tiger, please come back to your senses. The tiger is at its senses. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine in the future, <coughs> right beside the self-help section of the bookstore, 
Imagine there is a civilization help section and the self-help is for all those people who want to become a self-enlightened. Do you know? If you're here to live for yourself, you don't really need to be around people. But if you are here to live for people, you require uh, humanity's uh, presence. A civilization help section where the human being is has is has, has lived enough for this self this future self that for many human beings who are living they never get to see it because Shoryu Suzuki would say it's like life is like uh, you, the all of life is like building a boat the boat uh, goes you, you build a boat you get on this boat you paddle into the middle of the ocean and then the boat sinks what Shunryu Suzuki, I believe it was Shunryu Suzuki who said that, uh, what he meant, what that sage meant by that is that in life, if you live too much for the future, you're going to suddenly notice it to end. So the only way you can actually comfortably live for the future is after you have a certain confrontation with what emptiness means. And I don't know, right now you might be a young person listening to me, you don't need to confront the emptiness, go run at the fullness of life, you know. <clears throat> I feel life is uh, it, it every every moment has a shadow. The shadow is the parallel potentials of what could have happened to it. You know, it's like when you look at the light, you don't see shadows. You know, but when you're not faced towards the light, you're like, oh God, why is it so dark? <laughs> You go to the civilization help section and imagine there's a book, uh, uh, how to build an advanced civilization, you know. And that's the thing. Your life force as a creature is primarily, of course, for, for physical survival reasons, going to yourself. But when you realize your life's, life force can go beyond the idea of you, that the idea of you that your whole life you have been looking at is not the only idea here. That there has always been more, because that's the only point of an unknown universe. That means it's as if we are so small, I was like, even if there was a creator to this universe, did the creator keep us in mind? You know? And that's the phenomenal thing. Right now, we look at an ant and are like, look at this insect, it doesn't know anything. You know? <laughs> but what if we are ants? And that's when the unknown smiles at you again. When man realizes that it is our birthright to see how far our mind can advance. So many people have feared the unknown. Don't fear the unknown. Don't fear emptiness. Don't fear uh, nothing. Let me tell you why. Because it's nothing. There's nothing. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> it's the experience is not real. That's the hilarious thing, you know, about life. That it's like you're on the roller coaster ride until you're suddenly off it. And you're like, whoa, what was all that about? You know? 
that's what I feel like if there is an afterlife I'm just gonna go through this life and be at the end of it this voice is gonna be like okay so what was the point of all this <laughs> what was the point of manifesting um, <clears throat> at a point in history where uh, human beings are realizing they're no longer just subjects they are the process of humanity there is an honor that if we establish this uh, and I'm, I'm so excited talking about this because I know I'm an early bird talking about this because it, there has been nothing you know there has been many people who have said oh my god the earth is burning you know save the earth but very few people have actually looked at the flames to care for it because when you care you survive you know there was something that it broke my heart when I saw this you know it was this uh, it was this footage it was this YouTube video where it was this Muslim guy and his parents were in China and evidently I don't know what's going on there but there seems to be some sort of concentration camp thing going on there for minorities in certain countries like don't think every country is as liberated the media is filled with Western influence you know but many people don't realize so many events of unethical proportions is, is going on on this planet as I speak as I speak right now there are days of human beings being messed up you know and so you can't call yourself an advanced civilization you can't feel you're out of the quicksand when your feet is still in it do you know it doesn't matter how you know self-help is like you uh, trying so hard to get to a restaurant to get that great meal and eat it only to realize outside of that res restaurant the whole world is hungry that's what happens what's ultimately gonna happen to all those human beings who we're like look at these powerful egotistical people those powerful egotistical people are going to weep not because of evolved this planet is and that, those idiots in power controlling, how stupid are you? How stupid are you? What are you controlling? A civilization that is at an eight-year-old level? That means to control this civilization is like, go play with dirt. We're nothing yet. We're just like baby steps of a civilization. And, and there are idiots in the world trying to dominate the world. What, what, how stupid are they? What are they trying to dominate? The illusion that they were something more in their life? It is better to be less and see, see efficient civilization. There are these sentences, sorry guys, I got a bit, a bit emotional. Uh, there, Dylan Thomas, Dylan Thomas, he has these sentences he's written, which I personally consider these two sentences deserve to go if there was a museum for language. I don't know if you're a billionaire listening to me, Mr. Rubenstone, you go build a museum for the greatest statements in language. Keep, keep the linguistic technology alive. There are many human beings using language, but there are many, very few human beings actually looking at what language is, you know, and its implication of the, the relationship of a, an experiencer in existence and an existence simulating an experiencer. Dylan Thomas was saying this to his father on his deathbed, Dylan Thomas's father. Dylan Thomas looked at his father in his deathbed and he said, Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage. Rage. It's the beginning of the light. Okay? So that the purpose of human life to rage for whatever is here 
to rage to continue it. Because what is one lifetime? It is not enough time to do anything. Sometimes, when the mind breaks in front of the soul, you find eyes you never knew you had. I don't know, my ultimate effort is just wondering about what does it mean uh, for there. Like, imagine we had a sphere, and we had 8 billion stick figures on this sphere, and what would the options be? And it's very clear, either you uh, work on interior design or you work on the outer design. Just like a human being has a home house and they work on the inner design of the house and they also decide the house based on its outer design, it's very similar <clears throat> that many human beings should decide upon an outer design, a new ethos. I, I call that the ethos of civilization to work on the next grand effort in civilization. on a mass scale, on a mainstream level, that we are not just star stuff, we are mind stuff, we are unknown stuff. That means stuff is in an unknown place. And whatever anybody says about language, you can see how there a lot of this universe was being conducted in silence. If you want to look at how old the universe is, you know, we've just been speaking for like a, a couple seconds. Our c whole civilization's effort of communication so far. And it's the issue of morality being imposed too soon. Did you know that? That... Um, I mean, <clears throat> let us call it divine intervention. <clears throat> that the idea of doing what is right and seeing what is right and seeing what is wrong did usher man into a blindness, you know, a lot of the wars back in the day, it's so hilarious, it's literally, like, you could totally see how war started back in the day, you know, one person's like, I'm taking that, the other person's like, no, you're not, and then war, there we go, <laughs> that was, that was the whole point of war, the inner realms couldn't come into agreement, or trust wasn't there, that means there can be no great advancement, of human beings without trust but how does how is trust built trust is built in many people feeling they're playing the same game right so right now I would say everything's divided everyone's playing their own game every person is playing their own game they don't even some people don't even care about the world they're like you know what is this uh, I'll just take what I want and just go bunker down you know and that's not the r right way that is uh, that is the cowards success you know <clears throat> We want the success of the brave.
You know, there's this story from Napoleon. <clears throat> I don't think I'm pronouncing his last name properly, but Bonaparte. Definitely that I'm, I'm not pro pronouncing it with the right accent. But Napoleon, <clears throat> this French emperor, was one of his stories, one of the most unique individuals in this world because he had an inner authorization that surpassed others. <clears throat> there was something that Napoleon had allowed himself behind his eyes that was the direction in the outer eyes. You see, there's a difference between, uh, I mean, psychology has brought this whole thing of making us feel like wolves in the sense that there's alpha males and beta males and all that. I mean, sure, but it depends on what the civilization is. If the civilization became a mind, then uh, it would be a different display. You know, so I'm saying that um, this concept of the alpha beta is only one point. The alpha notices all the other wolves waiting. That's the only difference. You see, it's, it's three dimensions every human being needs to some way trust life to master. What does that mean? That these three dimensions are a dimension, uh, it's pretty much the archetypes of uh, Shiva, uh, let's say Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. <clears throat> and I remember in one of my poems I spoke about myself as if 20,000 years ago playfully I was looking through the eyes of <laughs> but anyways I'll tell you this these three dimensions are Brahman is the force of creation you got to realize that you need an ability in this life and that's to start effort literally put your foot on the gas if you as a human being in micro moments train yourself to put the foot on the gas when it comes to an intense heavy moment you'll be able to put your foot on the gas, right? That means being able to pilot the moment. That means, let's say you are a person, you go somewhere and you see that there's a bunch of people and all the people are sitting in the room quietly staring at each other. That means those people, nobody wants to pilot the moment. And it's not even the, the, the strategically the efficient move to pilot because so many people are waiting like scorpions. They want to see other, the other scorpion miss its sting and then sting. Like there are people like that, you know, <clears throat> but it's, um, you become comfortable with bringing things about, with exerting effort, whatever it is. You, 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 right now I'm drinking a, a Sprite, that's effort, okay, this is, this is technically creativity, my hand holding the Sprite in this way. It's creative. It could have held it in another way, in another way. <laughs> you know? Okay, nice. Um, so, guys, if, if other people um, feel they're more knowledgeable about other archetypes and other traditions and cultures that fall in these three categories, feel free to share. Like, I think Odin would be equivalent to Brahma, you know, or maybe Krishna, I don't know. <clears throat> but the idea of this is Vishnu is the maintainer, Shiva is the destroyer, and Brahma is the creator. Three dimensions. And these three dimensions are crucial to pilot. And there is actually a fourth dimension, but it's very seldom people realize they are the fourth dimension in reality. In, in regards to these three dimensions, that means you can witness them, these three, you can witness the, these three simultaneously, and believe it or not, you have been. That's why you feel people have stories, uh, have a storyline to their life. <clears throat> so, imagine you got comfortable. Imagine you brought a piece of paper. Guys, I, I think everybody should do this. Get a piece of paper in front of you and a pen, if you're listening. And I want you to just scribble. Just, just get comfortable drawing random lines on this piece of paper. You know? 
just draw, scribble the paper, draw random lines, meaningless lines. Just, just see how it feels to create a line on an empty piece of paper. Now, I want you to hold the notebook in your hand. So that was, hold, you moving the pen on the paper was Brahman. Now, you holding the notebook in your hand without the pen, that means the creative dimension is on hold, and uh, you're holding the notebook with both your hands, that's for how you're going to maintain what you started. You know, entrepreneurs are like prodigies of this. Sorry guys, I gotta make this part one. Uh, I'll be back for part two. Much blessings, thanks for tuning in.